All right, so we're going to read some little poems from my new ebook collection called Rhapsody in Snakeskin and Other Tales of Erotica and Horror, because those two things go so well together. All right, so um, I had one that starts out a little dirty, but I thought, you know, when you meet somebody, you don't go like straight for the panties. You've got to <laughs> warm them up a little bit, so I'm going to warm you up with something a little nicer. All right, this is called Continuing on a Theme. Historically, a garden has been a sign of luxury. It tells the world that its owner can afford the time or hire the manpower to tend the slow cultivation of flowers, herbs, and delicate deciduates like red Japanese maples, orchids, and hothouse irises whose crystalline petals exude candied fragrance and betray their hearts by sporting lush yellow beards. I haven't the time, cannot afford a gardener. Mine is an empty lot behind the crack house, choked with pernicious invasives, littered with needles, cans, condoms, where feral cats mate and raccoons and opossums birth their young. Only one with much dedication to a future vision of beauty can see the promise in that dormant land. We'll don gloves and work boots and organize the effort to bring spring to urban desolation to release or tame its wildness and co coax an orchard from malnourished soil. It is a trial, very much a labor of like, for one who would grow apples just to taste forbidden fruit and gain secret knowledge with which to understand the elemental chemistry of one woman. So that was your foreplay. So, this one is called God Damn. God Damn. I cannot sleep. My mind only gave me two hours rest tonight before it woke me. Recalling the shape of your mouth, that kiss, such a decorous introduction to you. It's like I've been bewitched or poisoned and I'm just waiting for the end. I imagine you slipping your finger into that little dish of honey and wiping your essence on my tongue. <laughs> so, <laughs> mm. The taste of you, sweet or salty, my mouth between your thighs, a little suction, a swirly, a tug. Your knees shaking, the little moans or gasps or grunts you'd make when I dragged my nails down your thighs, leaving red tracks behind and bruises on your perfect milky skin. If I wrote the alphabet with my tongue, <laughs> if I wrote the alphabet with my tongue, how far would we get? F, Q, Z? Would I have to start all over again, humming the alphabet song to make you come? What do you, would I swallow if you gushed? Yes. What would it take to make you cry, to squirm and say no, to push me away and then pull me close again, fucking me while I sleep, your hand over my mouth, whispering hush in my ear, don't fight. All right. So, you know, when you're like really in love with somebody and you write them lots of poetry and it's all super meaningful, and then you break up. So, this is one of those poems that I wrote for my lover. And originally it was called Raspberries and Cream. And I have since retitled it, I Hate You, You Fucking Fuck. <laughs> Raspberries, cream, dishes of milk, scoop of ice cream, caramelly toffee, kettle corn, sugar, wildflowers, orange blossom honey, things that melt in the mouth, dissolve on the tongue, burst with juicy goodness, oysters and rare beef, ashes, smoke, sage and desert, whiskey and ginger. Those are the flavors of your kisses and your body all the luscious ingredients required to make your
your signature cocktail. another one I wrote to that same person <clears throat> when I was getting a little frustrated with the way things were going and I decided I need to like uh, you know pull it out a little bit more <clears throat> so this is called daddy I want your bloody snatch clots be damned to quiet those soft storms inside me I want to strip off all your tenderness Reach in and pluck out what you keep hidden, leave you raw and aching as I have been. So dress pretty for me and lay out your toys. I'm gonna string up your hands, run that sharp wheel over your skin in all your tender places till they turn red and swell. I'm gonna slap, smack, bite, choke you, tie you up, pin you down, pinch you, crush you, catch your tongue between my teeth and squeeze. Take my tongue, push my way inside you as far as I can, tease you, entice you till you shake and shudder and cry my name. I'll cover your ears, plug you, I'll cover your eyes, plug your ears, turn you face down, your hair tight in my hands, part your legs, part your sex, empty myself inside you, fill all your vacant spaces and leave my stain on you. Come, don't come. I don't care anymore. <laughs> Because I'm not going to stop until you say you're mine. That's the safe word, I'm yours. Say that, and I'll let you look in my eyes. Touch me, hold me, kiss me, be relieved. And unless you say it, I'll come back and do this again. Meaner, harder, faster, and again with rack, wax and rope and needles. And again with subtle, sticky torments. And again, till your heart races at the thought of me and your courage quails. You think you're brave by not uttering those words. You think you can keep me at bay. You think that you can play this game better than I by withholding or staying silent, but it will bite you on the ass when I don't come back again. Your choice. It's time again to advance to the next level. She did not like that one. <laughs> So this is a nice, sweet one. Oh, <laughs> such disappointment. <laughs> um, but it was her favorite, so I will read it. It's called Origami. You are unfolding the origami of me with deft and simple turns, transforming the snowflake to the leaf, the frog into the swan, the finger trap into a treasure box, this tender task taken up in your white rooms amid the shadows of paper flowers, projects past and future, but your hands, they tremble so. Perhaps like me, you fear the world's inhospitality, that time will not accommodate all the plains and fissures of our desire, that nights steeped in shared solitude will be cruel and lonely, that the task will finish itself, treasure box into an airplane, fold itself up and fly away. story, but it's kind of long. Should we read it fast? Yes. Or are you satisfied? Do you need me to keep going? <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll read fast. This is a short one. Juliet says she will do anything for me. I test her. I say, lick my boots, and she does. I think perhaps that I will not kiss her again until she's brushed her teeth. When she goes into the bathroom and squats over the bowl, I follow her, slip my hand between her legs, pinch her vulva clothes. Her urine splashes over my fingers. Juliet moans, whether in pain or ecstasy, it's unclear. I let her finish, wash my hands, tuck her dress up over her shoulders, not caring that its stitches break as she stands shaking before me. When she's naked, her eyes wide and questioning, but full of trust and keen excitement, I lead her onto the balcony of my high-rise apartment and leave her there. Inside, I turn on the oven and place a hot towel inside to warm for her eventual return. I mix two cocktails, dirty martinis for dirty girls, and stand before the mirror, slowly brushing my hair and counting to 100. 
Juliet's teeth are chattering when I unlock the door and pull her inside. Her skin is cadaver cold. Her, nippers, her nipples are ice picks. She folds herself into my arms and trembles deliciously, her skin a welter of goosebumps. This girl who I may love, though I won't say it yet. This girl who I know already loves me. So delicious, so good. Her bare skin creamy beneath the warm towels I rub life into her limbs. She smells of city air, pollution exhaust, vague chemical signatures like track marks left behind. Juliet announces, I love you. I say only, I know. And we're done with it. I'm unsure how to defend myself against such honesty. Juliet's emotional sabotage is like being killed with a double dose of painful and slow-acting kindness. What can I do to her? What will she do for me? My head swims with possibilities. Duct tape her to the bed frame and ravish her. Stuff her cunt full of ice cubes or Milky Way bars. We go on a date and it's a monumental thing. She comes to collect me in her parents' borrowed car. Both strange and lovely, Juliet dresses like a mix of helper elf and biker with striped stocking cap, battered army boots, and a baby doll dress beneath a silver studded leather motorcycle jacket. She lets me slick red shine over her mouth and bite her sticky strawberry lips. Though she looks like a girl, she acts like a boy. It's bewitching. Her swagger sometimes morphs into a sachet and back again. She leads me by the elbow and fusses when her dress snags on a bit of broken fence railing. She's the alpha and omega, sweet and folding feminine and hard shelled masculine twisted into one. I can lick her up one side and down the other, just like a swirly chocolate vanilla soft serve cone. We dine in a dark steak place, it's air smoky and blue. Though the meat is soft and bloody, the red wine acidic, and the sourdough extra chewy, I don't taste a thing. My heart leaps like a child through a field. It trips and skips too fast. She smiles every time she looks at me. Her smiles are honey, molasses, black tar, spider webs, grappling hooks. They hold me and don't let go. We drive for miles through a silky summer night. Impossibly bright, the full moon is the color of fresh cream. She takes me to the seashore where black waves lap gray sands. We sit in the car, talking idly, smoking hash and moon gazing. I find a book beneath the, beneath the seat, a scholarly tome on Judaism, and have a new appreciation for her. She must be awfully brainy when she's not stoned, which is always. Her habit of getting and staying stoned means that nearly every conversation, except for the ones we have first thing in the morning, just after waking, and before she's made a grab for her handy-dandy get-high kit, are stilted, meandering, and punctuated by lengthy silences. Sometimes I find it annoying, but she's so very pretty and enraptured with me, it's become an intoxication of its own. After the beach, she drives further south along a winding road. The moon diminishes and sails high into the sky. It's lost its magic and looks like a weak light bulb hung in a vast, dark room. She takes me to a park where high grass shimmers and waves. Empty swings creak and blowing sand skitters over the walk. Juliet pours her love onto me like baptismal water. She eats me alive, her tongue deep in secret crevices, her golden hair slithering over my trembling thighs. I cannot but think of the end soon approaching, the cigarette ash that I'll grind out onto her face, the regret that will trail me for years to come. I wish I could open up like a flower, cut myself open and pull her, pull her deep inside, wrap her up inside of me, but the night wind cries and every moment is pricked with acute tension. I'm too distracted to come. There are other dates, other silences, other distractions. Mostly I cannot believe my good fortune. I'm certain that she's up to something. She talks to me about her friends but won't let me meet her parents. I don't know where she lives, only that she's too young to get into bars, and this crucial year between us causes problems. It's always my house, the car, the park. She has to leave for work, return the borrowed car, get home. She's a strange and gorgeous <coughs> child, and I fret about her lack of ambition. She wants so badly to be liked, to have me love her back. It irritates my heart. Her need is a tiny sand grain, rubbing, scratching, and burrowing inside me. I salve it, but the pearl still forms, a dead seed that will not sprout. Her love will not grow into the silvery, velvet-napped acacia. Juliet is too much of everything, too beautiful, too young, too wanting. If I stay with her, if I allow her gravity to pull me into her orbit, we will spin off into our own universe, a black hole. I realize at this point that I am spoiled in the way of wormy, fallen fruit, gone mushy and fermented deep inside its bruised core.